Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on CISA's Zero Trust Maturity Model Version 2, Expert Analysis and Implications. CISA recently released Version 2 of their Zero Trust Maturity Model, generating significant interest across sectors. Today, our panel of experts from CISA and the industry will provide insights on the new version of CISA's Zero Trust Maturity Model, including changes, analysis, and implications for public and private sector implementers of Zero Trust. Our panel consists of the following experts. Sean Connolly, Trusted Internet Connections Program Manager and Senior Cybersecurity Architect at CISA within the Department of Homeland Security. John Sims, Senior Technology Advisor at CISA. Jason Garbus, Principal and Founder at Numberline Security. And Alex Sharp, Managing Director at Sharp 42. Before we dive into the discussion, we have a couple of quick announcements. Please note that there won't be slides provided for this webinar. However, a recording of today's session will be available shortly after its conclusion. We request that you take a moment to fill out a brief survey located at the bottom of your screen before you leave. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help us improve future webinars. Thank you for joining us. I will now pass it off to John to begin the webinar. Hi, I'm John Sims from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and today we're going to talk uh, with you about the CISA Zero Trust Maturity Model to support the cloud security lines. This slide uh, provides points of contact to the Zero Trust uh, office within CISA, and you're welcome to communicate with us uh, about the work that we do at CISA or the maturity model at any time. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean Connolly. Hi, thanks, John. My name is Sean Connolly. Uh, just for some introduction of my background, I've been about 10 years at CISA. Uh, and then before that, I was a contractor at a federal agency. During that time, the last 15 years, I've been supporting and leading the TIC PMO, TIC, TIC, Trusted Internet Connections. It's been the primary way that the federal executive uh, civilian branch agencies have connected to the web, to the internet. And for the last or the first 10 years, uh, the TIC initiative was more focused on agencies connecting to the web through firewalls and like the old castle and moat perimeter. But we recognize with zero trust, moving security, moving visibility deeper inside the agency's network. Uh, John and I have both started to support uh, the zero trust efforts for the last few years. Aside for that, I've supported the Continued Diagnostic and Mitigation Program, Nancy P.S. Einstein programs. Those are uh, ways that CISA has been providing tools and visibility to the agencies. Outside those programs, I'm one of the co-authors of the NIST Special Pub 807 and Zero Trust Architecture that John will talk about in a moment. Also a supporting member of the Tech Modernization Fund Board, the TMF, that's a $1 billion fund that Congress has allocated to the federal agencies uh, that through the White House, OMB, some other agencies, we are uh, working to modernize and build better cybersecurity uh, uh, awards to help agencies with their improving their enterprise. So altogether, I've been about 20 years in the federal domain. So at this time, I'll pass the mic back over to John. Thank you, Sean. And um, John Sims, as I mentioned earlier, uh, been at CISA for about 10 years. Uh, I was one of the original uh, program managers for the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program, which deploys uh, censoring and dashboards to federal agency, uh, federal agency networks to gain uh, situational awareness as well as visibility into the security state of their networks. Uh, before I came to DHS, I was the Chief Information Security Officer at the Food and Drug Administration, uh, where I was in charge of the Security Operations Center, as well as the uh, uh, Senior Agency uh, Security Officer. And before that, I uh, supported a federal agency as a federal contractor and have been in the um, federal uh, domain, if you will, for about 25 years. And uh, the document we're going to focus on today, the Zero Trust Maturity Model, I was privileged to be one of the co-leads. 
So just to level set, uh, I wanted to talk briefly about CISA and uh, the cybersecurity division. So CISA has two main goals, uh, defend today and secure tomorrow. Defend today is really about doing what we can to uh, deal with urgent and evolving threats that uh, face uh, our stakeholders, which is federal agencies, state and local, critical infrastructure. Uh, Secure Tomorrow is really about looking long-term uh, at how we can address risks. I think that one of the, one of the keys to this is gonna be uh, using zero trust. In the cybersecurity division within uh, CISA, we are focused on four mission priorities, cyber defense operations, federal network governance capacity building, critical infrastructure, state, local governance and capacity building, as well as long-term cybersecurity. And I wanna focus uh, really on the federal network governance and capacity building. As I mentioned earlier, and as Sean mentioned, uh, both of us supported the CDM program uh, which is one of the, one of the uh, premier uh, cybersecurity programs that the, that the agency uses uh, to provide cybersecurity services and capability to federal agencies. Uh, Sean also mentioned the National Cybersecurity Protection System, uh, known as Einstein. Uh, that is also a uh, program that uh, has been in place for a number of years that support uh, visibility at the, the edge of the agency networks and has um, you know, recently been uh, you know, modernized to uh, support uh, a new program we have called Protective DNS, which provides DNS services to our federal agencies. Those are some key areas where uh, we have examples of, of some of the programs and services we provide. Longer term cybersecurity is really where CISA drives national efforts to create a more secure uh, ecosystem as collaboration with the private sector, uh, other government partners, as well as academia to foster cybersecurity. Um, you know, in terms of zero trust in this, in this, in this realm, you know, this is, a, this is like an opportunity to, uh, you know, allow us to lead uh, a lot of changes with regard to uh, cybersecurity architecture through zero trust. And uh, this can be, you know, really key for, you know, young professionals, college students, and even, you know, K through 12, as they're starting to look at, you know, what cybersecurity could mean to them in terms of a career. I think the concepts we're gonna talk about today and the work that we're doing with the Cloud Security Alliance really is gonna lay a really solid foundation to advance that. So some of our related efforts uh, really focus on uh, strategy, technical governance and operations. And on, on the right side of the uh, slide here, you'll see there are a number of publications that uh, CISA has either led or been involved in uh, to advance uh, you know, cybersecurity, uh, starting with the Federal Zero Trust Strategy, which is referred to as uh, OMB Memorandum 2209, uh, our Zero Trust Maturity Model, which we're going to talk about today, and uh, one of the deliverables out of the Executive Order 14028, the Cloud Security Technical Reference Architecture. Uh, these are key documents that really uh, support some of the core elements of Zero Trust. And in addition to that, uh, we, have, we have done, uh, Sean and I have worked on the Trust Internet Connections uh, program for a number of years. And this recent uh, version 3.0, which is, is really about uh, evolving uh, you know, that program to support a more flexible uh, you know, boundary protections and architectures to enable cloud. Um, that's another area where we've, we've been successful in, uh, you know, developing key capabilities uh, and use cases to support some elements of zero trust. Along the way, uh, these documents represent years of work. We've done a great deal of uh, work in coordination to ensure that there's uh, alignment 
uh, between these different elements um, to provide that holistic view in terms of the applicability of the guidance. In terms of the federal zero trust efforts, um, there's, there's a significant amount of work that's been underway for the past couple of years, uh, not only from the, D, the Department of Defense, but also with, with NIST, as well as the, the General Services Administration. In terms of the documents, they, they cover a wide range of, of, of views. Uh, there's the principles that uh, you know, Sean co-led uh, with regard to uh, NIST SP-800-207 to focus on zero trust architecture. I'll just note that that document came out uh, just prior to uh, the solar winds incident in December of 2020. And so that, that represents years of work that really preceded that, that major incident that really set up the, the, uh, the executive order 14028 to really refocus the federal efforts on zero trust. And the strategy I mentioned earlier, uh, the OMB memorandum 2209, that's really the, the, the federal strategy to, uh, to uh, begin the transition to zero trust architectures. And within that publication, there are a number of tasks that uh, the Office of Management and Budget has directed agencies uh, to focus on within a couple of uh, fiscal years to really ensure that, that uh, you know, some core capabilities are implemented to start to uh, transform their agency capabilities and their architectures to zero trust. Um, the zero trust maturity model version one uh, that's, uh, that was developed uh, in 2021 to support uh, the executive order um, and also uh, the federal cloud security technical reference architecture that was also uh, a document that was released out of the executive order. Now I'm gonna talk about the zero trust maturity model. So the zero trust maturity model, as I mentioned, uh, the initial version was released in uh, September of 2021. Uh, after release, we issued a request for comments period to ask industry and the public to review the document and provide feedback to CISA uh, so that we could enter into uh, a version two uh, to you know, advance our understanding of zero trust and also to really just bake out some of the concepts that we knew were uh, you know, generally uh, needed additional uh, expertise and, to inform uh, some of that longer term view. The intent behind version one was to support federal agencies uh, as, a, as they developed their zero trust strategies, which was a, a 60 day task out of the executive order 14028. And then also, uh, just after we released the Zero Trust Maturity Model, OMB released in the Memorandum 2209, which we call the Federal Zero Trust Strategy, which provided a, a lot more detail in terms of how the federal government was going to advance zero trust. So the structure of the Zero Trust Maturity Model is really laid out in five main pillars. Uh, we have identity, devices, networks, applications and workloads and data. And you'll see in the graphic to the right underneath, we'll have visibility and analytics, automation and orchestration, as well as governance. And I'll just note here that there's, there's a different representation to what you see here in our zero trust maturity model and what the DOD uh, uses for their reference architecture. And you know one of the key reasons that that we looked at uh, adding visibility analytics, uh, automation orchestration and governance uh, at, the, at the bottom of the, of, the, uh, of the graphic to really represent that cross-cutting nature of those key components uh, is because we were looking to identify key areas where federal agencies could begin today to advance those capabilities to start to understand some of the very uh, you know, 
simple things that they need to focus on and understand before they start uh, advancing zero trust. So in October, when we received the, the input, uh, October of 21, uh, from the request for comments, we, see, we received uh, just under 400 uh, comments that really covered a, a wide variety of topics and areas within the zero trust maturity model. And I'll just note that uh, if you look on the graphic on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see that the vendor community uh, really provided substantial input. Uh, the other areas were federal agencies. We had a couple of academic institutions as well as uh, trade associations that uh, provided feedback. Uh, additional sources of feedback that really influenced uh, version two were uh, reviews of the agency zero trust implementation plans, which were a direct result uh, of the release of the OMB memorandum M2209, uh, as well as uh, work that uh, Sean and I uh, did with John Kinderbog, who is the really the uh, father of zero trust, if you will, um, worked on the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee uh, with industry to inform presidential policy on zero trust and trusted identity management. And also modernization deep dives that have been conducted over the uh, past few years with federal agencies. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Sean to cover the rest of the slide deck. Thank you, John. So now we'll do a quick deep dive into the differences and changes that uh, have happened in the second version of the maturity model. So the first slide you see here uh, represents the stages an organization will go through as they move away from the traditional architecture, usually best represented by the castle moat philosophy, as they move through their different stages to a more optimal uh, architecture. So originally in the version one, we had traditional, advanced, and optimal. From those deep dives that John was talking about with federal agencies, and there's 20 large agencies, the ones we're all familiar with, State Department, Veterans Affairs, Justice, but then there's, I don't know how you count them, there's 80 or 100 plus of the small agencies. So we had many discussions with a wide spectrum of agencies with different missions. We recognize their organizations were asking for the most help was moving out from that castle moat and trying to get to the advanced. So in the second version, we introduced a fourth stage, the initial stage. This helps organizations understand what we mean as we try to move out from that traditional moving next to the advanced. So again, we now have four stages, traditional, initial, advanced, and optimal. And now we'll move on to the pillars and how we uh, amended or updates on the pillars. So first pillar you see is identity. We all recognize with zero trust, identity is a key component as we move security closer to the data and application being secured. So in the identity pillar, we gave updates regarding phishing resistant, multi-factor authentication, MFA. Uh, there's a large and clear push from the White House, OMB, as well as CISA's director, Jen Easterly, about adopting phishing resistant MFA, so we made sure language aligned with that thought leadership. There's also been a shift on the civilian side uh, before where agencies were primarily using what we call uh, PIV cards, CAC cards, is a card you see where you insert the card into a computer for authentication to identify who the person is using that card. Uh, there hasn't been widespread adoption of that uh, across all the federal enterprise. So one of the things we introduced was being able to use phishing resistant MFA via FIDO2. Fast identity online. This is a big shift in understanding for the agency. Like I said, there's been adoption or sort of stagnation of the adoption of PIV and CAC cards. Being able to use FIDO2 is a game changer inside the federal government to move agencies along with adopting feature resistant MFA. We've also added uh, flexibility to identity stores 
emphasizing integration across self-managed and hosted identity stores, including additional new uh, content around access management functions. The next pillar is the device pillar. Uh, inside government, it can be tricky how agencies uh, uh, allow or support bring your own device, BYOD. So we gave greater definitions to help agencies. Some agencies do allow some type of, or tolerate some type of BYOD. Other agencies really do not support bring your own device. So we gave better clarification around those. We update the policy enforcement and compliance functions to address software and configuration management. And those cross-cutting capabilities that John mentioned before, the automation, orchestration, governance capabilities, we include deep provisioning. How do you take a device off the network? How do you offboard devices? These are areas we didn't uh, really discuss in the first version. The agencies really wanna know how, so as assets or people leave the organization, how do we remove those devices? The next pillar we'll talk about is the network pillar. The network we focused, or uh, the, the changes that were requested from the stakeholders, we revised network segmentation to promote micro segmentation based on application profiles. You see there's a lot of SASE vendors. How uh, would their products are able to uh, segment different applications or being able to go maybe from one SAS uh, cloud solution to another, or it could be more in the IaaS, one different application, the IaaS. Uh, uh, cloud providers themselves. So it's key that we update the segmentation part. We also added network traffic management functions and network resilience functions. And we also incorporate elements to the threat protection function within the visibility analytics capability. The next pillar is applications and workloads. Uh, we update the application access function to incorporate contextual information we enforce expiration conditions. Again, going back to what I talked about before, as things decline or come off the network, what, how do we support those type of expirations? We want to better align to the principles of uh, least privilege. And we also updated the capability sections themselves, uh, getting more, uh, as agencies are starting to move out more on CICD and uh, DevSecOps principles, formalizing code deployments, how to restrict access to different environments, and promoting that shift to immutable workloads. The last pillar, data, I think from what we've seen the discussions that we've had with different stakeholders, it's really one where I think we're still looking at the most maturity, most opportunity to expand what we mean here. Uh, but we did offer, expand the data encryption functions to support encrypting data across enterprise there's a need to uh, better articulate how to formalize key management policies and to incorporate cryptographic agility, revise the data inventory management section of the pillar and it added data categorization functions. Uh, John mentioned the federal zero trust strategy, uh, OMB release, there is a uh, tasker in that about data tagging. So we ensure we align with the data tagging elements in the White House memo itself. And then the last slide here, I'm sorry, the last of the capabilities, uh, the visibility, the automation, orchestration, the governance, these are at the base of that Greek temple. Each of these have been updated. We also, uh, big difference between the version one and the second one, each of these capabilities themselves now pillar independent past the maturity before these uh, capabilities are simply uh, cut across the different pillars, but now each of these had their own independent path and ma uh, maturity. Then, uh, and then we update the recommendation across each of the pillars themselves. So as we close out here, the next slide, this we consider like the big picture. I think it's easy for us as technicians and architects to kind of look at the pillars individually or the, the different capabilities, but we wanna make sure we understand the big picture. This is kind of a summary of everything we just talked about between the pillars and the capabilities. And really not meant to be read like line for line, but just understanding what we're trying to do. You can see the stages on the left side, traditional, initial, advanced, and optimal. Then you have the pillars across 
the top, those columns, if you will, the matrix across each of those pillars or really combines or really binds everything together are those capabilities, visibility, automation, I'm sorry, visibility and analytics, automation and governance. So to just summarize here, we'll go next slide. The, um, the themes that were talked about, uh, we've defined a longer term purpose of the maturity model. We updated to align with OMB's direction, improve the maturity model, added that initial stage, we expanded the content and guidance across each of the pillars, and we clarified the terms and concepts. I think before the maturity model is roughly about 20 pages. I think the version two is about 30 pages, so about 50% update. At the same time, we did not want to make this a large document. We did not want to make this a reference architecture. Uh, with the TIC program, we've released literally hundreds of pages of guidance. We tried to make this light to make it more abstract, but help it be adaptable to whatever type of organization is using the maturity model. So as we look ahead, there's a couple areas we're interested in here, and I'll bring in John to talk about uh, some of this. Uh, we're looking not as much like coming out with a version three of the maturity model anytime soon, but maybe Annex is going deeper dives into some of the pillars. Uh, we recognize there's a lot of uh, interest in the application pillar, then also in operational technology. There's uh, areas for us to focus on. It's a little different as we talk to different stakeholders for uh, OT versus enterprise. So we may uh, expand or develop uh, guidance toward those two areas. Then we may also look at use cases, focusing on, okay, how would an agency or organization be able to use these based on, you can see here's just some uh, speculative or pre-decision use cases. What does it mean for context aware, access management, developing solution architectures for cloud workload identity, micro segmentation, possibly something on ZTNA or SASE. John, anything else you wanted to add on that one before we close out? Yeah, just real quick, Sean. I, you know, the the important you know takeaway from this slide is that, you know, as Sean indicated, we're not looking to uh, you know do a, a significant rewrite of the zero trust maturity model as a core document, but rather you know add some some technical depth to uh, accompany uh, the zero trust maturity model. To, to give us a little bit more understanding of some of the, um, the details behind uh, some of the uh, transformations that really need to be made. And you know, Sean indicated that you know, we're, you know, data is, is one area that I think is very challenging for uh, a number of organizations um, you know, when, the, when they're looking at how do they get a hold of their, their data inventory, uh, doing categorization and then you know, uh, looking at ways to apply zero trust in a, in a gradient model versus a one size fits all. And I think that when we look at what that could represent in terms of uh, how, we, how we look at zero trust strategically, I think that providing that level of, of awareness and context is important. But also, you know, one of the key tenets, you know, of, of zero trust is really about how do you protect the data? And one of the one of the primary ways in which uh, you know you get access to data is through the application stack. And so, making sure that we have solid uh, you know use cases and and technical depth on the application uh, pillar topics is going to be really important. And lastly, I'll just say that on the operational technology. Uh, you know, areas that we're looking at, um, you know, there's a clear understanding that, that um, the operational technology environments are converging with the business IT environment uh, and a lot of these organizations that have industrial control systems. And so, you know, we're looking at, at thoughtful ways that we can work with industry um, to advance cybersecurity approaches, uh, predominantly through zero trust to provide better security, because um, these areas are very critical to uh, you know, the American public. I think that closes out. The next slide really just covers, we've, government has a lot of acronyms. And so we just wanted to just provide a slide you know, explaining or uh, referencing all these different acronyms. And the last slide just has some of the point of contact information for media. We ask that you read the, the top one for media inquiries. 
Uh, the maturity model we discussed is at that URL, sysa.gov, zero trust maturity model. And then we have a mailbox for anyone to reach out to for questions that we could uh, send out to the appropriate stakeholders. So with that, I'm going to open up the panel to the greater team here at CSA. Thank you. So I'll kind of step in real quick. Uh, first of all, uh, brief introduction. Uh, Jason Garbus and I are... Uh, volunteers at the Cloud Security Alliance. Uh, we both chair a couple of the Zero Trust working groups. I handle uh, basically the two groups that are focused on guiding principles and governance. Uh, Jason handles um, architecture, business value, uh, the, the, the architecture and business value working groups. So in the course of our work, we end up working with organizations, private and public, you know, all facets of government, international organizations, plus commercial on their zero trust architectures. By the way, anybody who's interested in volunteering and joining, uh, there'll be a slide at the end that shows you how you can contact us. We're always looking for folks that are willing to, you know, dive in, roll up their sleeves. And even if you just want to participate to keep abreast of what's going on, uh, feel free to join us. So I'll start, a, I'll start out by throwing something out to Sean and John that's getting a lot of discussion in the, in the public domain. Um, there's a couple of different models out there, most notably uh, CISA and DOD. Maybe you can talk to that in a bit and then, um, Jason and I can fold in with some color commentary, you know, working in the in the wild with organizations and what we're seeing. I'll go ahead and start. Um, so we do a, a, a lot of work um, coordination uh, in addition to um, just collaboration with our uh, partners at, at the Department of Defense. Uh, and I can I can say that you know I think that you know when when they release their reference architecture, uh, and we released our zero trust maturity model, you know, several months after that, um, there were questions about, you know, why we represented ours differently than DOD. And I think that one of the key things that we have to keep in mind is that a DOD has a very different structure in terms of how they, how, how they manage information technology and, and the different environments. Uh, not only at the headquarters level, but also at the service component level. And so I think that there, there's a, a, an opportunity for, uh, you know, a little level of alignment uh, on that side of the U.S. government that we don't necessarily have on the federal side. And, I, and what I mean by that is that, you know, a lot of our federal agencies are large and in some cases federated. And, and what I mean by that is they... They need to function independently for various reasons to execute their mission to support their agency and, and the American people. And so, one thing that we've we've talked about with, uh, you know, Randy Resnick, who's the director of the Zero Trust Portfolio Management Office, and his deputy uh, Colonel Gary Kite, is we we've talked about really it's the importance of the security outcomes. Uh, you know, that's a result of, of our execution of zero trust uh, to move away from perimeter security architectures to one that's really focused on, on zero trust principles. And, and so when we get down to it, I think at the end of the day, that's, that's the key takeaway from, uh, from my perspective. Sean, do you want to add anything to that? No, John, I think you're, you're spot on. So there's, like John is saying, the DOD is very different authorities than on the civilian side. Uh, we always say that OMB, the White House, is the team captain. On Zero Trust, we support a line with what OMB is leading in, in that strategy, but we assess ourselves. We don't have the authorities toward the agencies of the way DOD, the Zero Trust office has within DOD. In the risk tolerance, like John is talking about, how someone like Department of Justice supports and secures their networks is really different than someone like NASA or NOAA with weather data. And so we have to be cognizant and aware of these risk tolerance differences and just ensure that we provide 
guidance scope that can support this greater spectrum of agencies and their mission. So it's really not as much about us saying this is the one way to apply zero trust. Um, so that's why within the our maturity model, you see it mentioned a couple of times, there are many paths of this, and we just say this is one way. Also, it helps internally. John and I have talked a couple times about CISA services and different programs that we use to uh, support the agencies as they are modernizing their architectures. And so this helps when agencies are trying to understand what is CISA doing or why is CISA doing it this way, as those programs align to our maturity model, it helps everyone kind of have a tabula rosa, if you will, like a Rosetta Stone, just in terms of what we mean by it. So it's more, it's not, it's not as much we're trying to say, this is the only definition for zero trust. This is the only way to do it. I think even talking, we talked about John Kindervog, you know, it's not as much trying to get word by word reading what we mean by it. It's more just being able to understand our position and then take that guidance and then apply it best out to the organization themselves. They need to be, I have some independence to think about it. And I'll just end on one thing. I think, uh, you know, we worked for a long time with NSA. A lot of the guidance has come out of zero trust is from the NSA. And when I hear about this, I think Kevin Bingham, who's led a lot of this, the NSA, I can just hear Kevin Bingham's voice in my head saying, adversary, so go give a crap if the, if the victim is using seven pillars or five pillars, right? They're just looking for the low hanging fruit to get at. So really how at best this can be used by the different organizations to uh, apply to their mission. Yeah, I think it's, um, I'm glad that we're having this conversation that it's definitely not a, you know, CISA versus, versus DOD type of model. And that it's, I think that extrapolates to the enterprise side as well, where I, I work a lot with enterprises and there, I think, really eager to start using the new version of the uh, maturity model. Um, and it's also, I think, um, you know, relevant that it's um, should be adapted for each organization because this is a framework is a great starting point, but for any given enterprise or really for any given agency, you know, the pathway might be slightly different based on not just where they're starting from, but the specifics of their, of their mission and where they're going with that. I'm curious, John and Sean, are you seeing now, now that this is published, is there kind of a wave of, refreshes or agencies that are saying, okay, now we want to do another self-assessment and see where we are based on this new model? Well, I'll start out. Um, I, I don't know that we've seen a wave. We've had a lot of interest in, in you know, talking about, you know, the, the key changes. But, you know, in, in terms of the assessment, I, I really hope that organizations, you know, not just the federal government, but anyone that's taking a zero trust uh, approach to, to transforming their cybersecurity is continually assessing where they're at in terms of their transition. Because I think that, you know, one of the, one of the other things we've talked with our, our colleagues at DOD about a lot is what we're going to learn within the next couple of years. And, and just within the last year and a half to two years, I, I can tell you that there's been a, a fundamental shift in what we were thinking in 21 versus what we're thinking today. And, and luckily we, we have the uh, memorandum 2209 to kind of shape how, that, how that's gonna be executed over the next couple of years. But you know, when we look at some of, some of the things we need to understand, we're learning as, as we're going. And so as our friends would say, we're, we're flying the plane as, as we're building it. Uh, you know, and so that continual assessment, I think, is going to help reinforce uh, planning and strategy to really provide clarity and uh, sharpen our pencils for, uh, you know, making sure that we have the resource planning uh, necessary to accomplish this, because it's absolutely not about technology. Technology is a supporting element to this, but it's really about making sure that you have uh, the proper resourcing, such as, uh, you know, people that are, are expert in, in these areas to help you, uh, you know, break down those silos and start to advance a zero trust in a unified direction. Yeah, I, I need to build on that a bit. Uh, it's not about technology. It's not about product. It's a cooperation between people, process, organization, and technology. And one of the things I see in the model that is, is highlighted more in version two than version one is the non-technical aspects. I mean, they were there before, but I don't think they were clarified the way they are in this version of the model. You know, like Jason, I work with a lot of enterprises 
and they seem to be welcoming the four levels. They seem to be embracing that because they just seem to feel that the gaps between the three were not as clear and they were more significant. Now having the fourth, it makes it easier to create a phased approach. You know, so they do a gap analysis to understand where they are, where they want to go, and then they can use the four, the four levels to you know guide their journey. That seems to be a very welcomed um, feature in the in the new version. I don't want to um, oversell the first maturity model. So typically, just for uh, guidance, uh, just awareness for everyone, uh, we mentioned a number of documents that we've worked on, and typically when John and I work on guidance, or even we work with GSA or NIST or some others to produce typical, you know, peer level guidance. We work for about six months kind of internally and then going through all the different stakeholders to release. And there's usually a draft, all stuff. Uh, that first version of maturity model, we started from our first like sync email to actually get into the agency within about two weeks. So it was a greatly wow. compressed time cycle. We need to get out there quickly because going back to what happened, uh, agencies had 60 days to submit their draft implementation plans to the agency. This is again the summer 2021. And we had to get the our like the way we're trying to shape those discussions, those agencies quickly so they had time in that 60 days to then articulate those plans that came to us. So really, you know, we built off that framework that you're talking about, Alex, but between version one and version two, we were able to understand to your point, um, there's definitely the human element that's missing from the maturity model in general, but we concentrate on the tech stack, but we're able to articulate some more on the, the governance and the human element in ways we just couldn't in that first two weeks. So loud and clear, and thank you. I think that um, I want to touch on something John said, which is that um, kind of we're, we had a really interesting time in the industry. And at first I want to you know commend both of you and it, it, the broader set of people inside the federal government who put together this really valuable set of resources that you outlined. And I think taken together both for the private sector and the public sector, that it's, I think we have so many of the ingredients that we need to be able to start moving forward with actually delivering real value and having things that we can share um, about how enterprises have improved themselves. So I think that over the next two, three years, you know, we really have a great opportunity in the industry to change how we're doing things, but also talk about it, share best practices, develop things like design patterns for implementing this and metrics around, how do I actually measure mathematically, right? With some data that says, hey, I've improved, I've moved from here to there. And I think that that's kind of the next, one of the next steps I'm looking forward to. I think, uh, you know, just to pick on one part of that, Jason, like segmentation. What does segmentation mean, right? It's really different when we're talking about a 40-year-old mainframe monolithic application that we're going to try to move to the cloud or something better, but it's going to take a while versus something that may already be some platform as a service. You can do segmentation different ways. And so we, we need to understand that there needs to be a balance between legacy and, uh, you know, the 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 on-prem type of networks that are still going to be around for a while, and then what we can shape it more in the SaaS or the IaaS or the PaaS uh, environments too. So I'm just using that as an example, but loud and clear that there's going to be differences we need to recognize. Yeah, no, the other thing I'll just um, I'll just say, you know, just going back to what we were talking about with the what's next slide. Um, when we look at when we look at what we're where we're at in terms of like. Uh, you know, looking at technical debt, um, you know, every organization has it, you know, everyone has, you know, something that's like legacy, that AS400 sitting in the dark corner that's been blinking for 15, 20 years. And, you know, nobody, nobody wants to touch it because it might break. And I think that one of the things that we're really looking to do, and I, I think this came out of our Secure by Design um, uh, campaign that we released uh, a couple of weeks ago, is looking at how we can take and, and build in design principles um, to advance cybersecurity out of the box. And so when we look at application modernization in particular, you know, we know that there are a lot of the unexploitable vulnerabilities and just, you know, vulnerabilities in software based upon, you know, compilers that, that are not really good at memory management. So uh, one of the things that one of the key components is we're looking at how we can do memory safe uh, modernization using modern application uh, programming languages. 
to really drive some of this. And this is really where that, that, that long-term view has to come into place. And, you know, on, on that first couple of slides, I, I talked about that long range view that CISA has. That, that's really where I think that what we're doing today is going to lay that groundwork for our future. And so hopefully, hopefully that's, that's um, something that, that folks are thinking about when they're talk, when they're thinking about resourcing and, and what it's gonna take to get from that advanced to that mature state because it's gonna have to evolve and we're gonna have to continually fine tune that, that backend application stack and technology to make sure that it's keeping pace with, you know, uh, staying ahead of the adversary. You know, John, that's interesting because a lot of what you, you know, a lot of the themes that you just mentioned are within, you know, the prime drivers within the recently released national cybersecurity strategy. We're talking about shifting liability to the product vendors, right? And long before that strategy came out, we saw, um, you know, your, your, your lead, Jen Easterly, and uh, the cyber czar, Chris Inglis, talk about that very extensively. So it's not a surprise that we're seeing it, you know, envisioned in like future work and some of the, the gaps that need to be filled. Um, you know, devices, operational technology, to your point, are um, a beast until their own where the process, where the principles translate, but the implementation is significantly different than you would see in a traditional IT enterprise. Absolutely. One thing I'll just say, uh, you know, is that, you know, there's, this is a, this is like one of the most unique times that, um, that I've seen in cybersecurity in the federal space where we've got the administration and the whole of, the U.S. government, whether it's the DOD uh, components or the federal civilian, and just leaning into some of these core strategies that are, are really necessary um, to, to advance cybersecurity into the future. And so, um, you know, zero trust is, is really a, a, a prime opportunity to, to help bring all that together uh, and, and in terms of like the architecture and the principles to really drive it. So, uh, you know, this has this been a, a, a really fantastic time to be involved in, in the work that we're doing here at CISA. Yeah, I think John and I said we've been supporting federal IT for 20 plus years and we haven't seen momentum like this in that 20 plus years, more uh, like segmented or disparate initiatives, but the whole of government to use that abuse term. It really is it's, it's unique to what's going on right now. Yeah, very true. Very true. Uh, you, you know, something else we we talked about was the data aspect, right? That's something, um, and I'd love to get Jason's perspective, but dealing with government agencies and private entities, they struggle with the data. You know, how do you categorize the data? Um, you know, any hints and tips on that? Any thoughts about future work? You know, one of the things I recommend is looking at stack ranking your data doesn't have to have mathematical precision. You know, you, you have an inherent ability to categorize it in four buckets, or even if you want to do three buckets or five, you know, start there and work your way down. Do you see similar things from from your perch, from your, from where you guys sit, or are you getting a different perspective? Well, I think I'll, I'll start. Um, I think that, you know, that, that discussion about data is, is something that's, that's going to be probably one of the newer discussions with regard to zero trust. Um, you know, ever since we had the breach uh, back in June of 2015 with OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, um, where we had, you know, 30,000, uh, you know, records that were exfiltrated out of that, uh, out of that, uh, OPM, uh, data center. I think that that was, that was kind of like the solar winds moment back in 2015, where it was, it really took everyone off guard, um, because of the, just the, the enormous value of that data, um, and I think that, you know, when we look at what data represents to 
the federal government in particular, we've, we've always fallen in on what's called the Federal Information Processing Standard 199, FIPS 199, which allows you to look at your data and categorize it in the high, moderate, or low um, you know, security baselines. And so on top, of, on top of that, we have the high value asset uh, program that we established just after uh, the OPM breach. And that's giving us a different view of what data really represents in the context of FIPS 199 um, to the American people and the federal government. And so I, I was uh, lucky enough to work with the, uh, work with the uh, folks that, that established the high value asset program and lead it uh, in 2018. And one of the things we we're looking at is how we could uh, take the amplif amplification guidance that's in the FIPS standard and use that to increase beyond the baseline for security controls. And I think that when we look at zero trust, we really need to do that because I think that the cost factors associated with trying to do a one size fits all is gonna be too enormous and, and it's gonna price us out of the uh, ability to do reasonable uh, risk management and cybersecurity practices. Yeah, I think that even, um, you know, data is, data is hard because it's kind of the apex of everything, right? It's, you get to data either directly or you get to data indirectly through the application. So there's so many different pathways uh, to get to it. And I think you know, there's the basics that you have to do. So, you know, pick two, three, four or five buckets, at least do some level of data classification, obviously make sure you're doing the right level of encryption. Um, and also look at when you're, going down the zero trust pathway you know clearly understand where the high value data is prioritize that and look at things that utilize identity and device context to control access to it i mean this is exactly you know what you what you what you all put together on the uh in the maturity model but making sure that you do your basics and then you can start to layer in some of the more advanced things like identity and device context and use that as part of the the policy decision point for access uh for access into that Let's um let's talk a little bit about the the different pillars and we've had some discussions around how organizations might approach this and we know there's no right or wrong answer but I think a general question Sean and, and John of uh, should I look at one pillar and try to kind of maximize that pillar you know before the others or do I try to look at all five at once as well as the cross cutting and try to advance incrementally kind of in parallel Yeah I think um so I'll talk more on the federal civilian executive focus. I mentioned it in the deck there, the uh, adoption or rate of adoption toward identity solutions. I mentioned fast identity online, phishing resistant MFA. That was clearly a focus of OMB to have a stronger or a greater adoption rate of just phishing resistant MFA, whether it is the PIV and CAT card or FIDO. Um, there's also just in general uh, in the civilian fleet pushing out EDR and point detection response agents in ways that we haven't before. That's more on the device side. Uh, so there are there are focuses in, from that strategy to help an organization understand, do they have a strong uh, visibility into, into their endpoints? Do they need better adoption of MFA? So I think one of the brilliance of the, uh, the strategy, if you will, is for an organization that is Started, where do I begin? This is an easy way. There's three or four technical solutions, I think, uh, between the pillars and help an organization engage. Okay, this is where I need to focus. To your point, Jason, maybe I'm not strong in one or another, or maybe it's going to be just easier for us to push out this solution right now based on our architecture. I know there's different ways to attack it that are uh, inside uh, the strategy. Another one internally that's important to federal civilian is um, uh, DNS. We have a new CIS has a new DNS solution for these uh, civilian executive agencies to embrace much better, much more flexible, able to uh, support you know different types of environments or architectures that we didn't have in the old DNS solution. Um, but again, I think it's critical for like an outside organization just to recognize DNS and the command and control functions that an adversary can use and understand. Okay, can we shape our better visibility into the DNS that's going outside our networks to understand who's talking to who? And I'll just uh, I'll just add real quick. Uh, you know, 
one of the one of the nice things about um, the federal strategy in 2209 that Sean was just talking about is for each pillar, there's there's a number of tasks that are are fundamental approaches that agencies can start doing, uh, you know, in near term uh, to start changing the landscape uh, on their attack surface. So um, that's just that's kind of to to some of the details that Sean was just providing. So it's really not just a focus on one pillar, and then when you're done, focus on the next. It's really about looking across each of the pillars to see what's low hanging fruit and where you have strategic opportunities based on where you are today to advance uh, zero trust along the way. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And when you're prioritizing by, um, you know, by use case or by application or data source, then that gives you the opportunity to look at, um, you know, to use the NSTAC terminology, you map the transaction flow across those and you might say, okay, I want to focus on this high value piece of data, which is accessed through this application that's running in this workload. And, you know, this group of users use these types of devices to access it. So now you got this pathway across all of those and you can say, great, you know, I'm very, I'm at the traditional level right now and I want to increment across all of those. So you're doing a fairly narrow you know, improvement, but you're going across all the pillars because you're looking at it through this transaction flow. And I think that that can deliver a lot of value really quickly and get get you out of the trap of saying, I need to get to you know level three in data before I even start on on devices, for example. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the other, you know, the the data flows are very, very important. You prioritize them based on the value of the data. Excellent point. What I do advise folks is to get their identity and access management act together, you know, kind of like we were talking about a second ago, because once you have that, you can actually progress through all of the pillars and you can move across your enterprise. Um, identity and access management is foundation to everything we do in Zero Trust. So that is the only, that's the only thing that I tend to look at, a, a, you know, as foundational across all the pillars. Um, you know, other than workflows. I think one thing real quick is the interoperability that's starting to happen. We're seeing between some of the pillars. I don't mean like overcomplicate or say this is, you know, based on uh, zero trust, but like the way the SASE vendors are, uh, they're able to look uh, to the device itself that the user's using and see, is the EDR client still working or not? If it's popped, then the SASE, the network side's okay, then we should probably should suspect that device the way there's now token binding going on where the identity is now mapped to a particular device itself. So against the identity device of an adversary steals that token, but they're on a different device. It really makes that token useless. So it's just that cross pillar uh, compatibility is starting to happen. That we're interested in. Yeah. yeah so I think, that that's, I think that's, that, that's definitely a really interesting area of the future uh, for the future. And it's, it's, Definitely an advanced use case, but the idea of having this context that flows through to, let's say, a DLP solution. What can the DLP solution do that's yeah. interesting with identity and device context for the user? I think that's that's really the future. Um, that's also saying that the market forces are taking shape, where the vendors are starting to do a lot of the work to set the stage, kind of like what John was talking about before, about moving the uh, responsibility back to early, you know, shifting left into the product vendors. That really is facilit is going to facilitate a lot of what we're trying to achieve. It'll just come as part of everything else we do. I mean, hope hopefully it's done in a way that's open and not uh, not proprietary. Yeah, that's a whole I, other conversation. A whole other conversation, <laughs> and. Uh, Fortunately, uh, well, I'd like to think that we've all learned not to go down that route, but we'll see what happens. Righty, thank you all so much. Um, we're nearing the end of our time here. So I wanted to open up the floor for any final thoughts before we close out. Um, I'll, I'll just say that I think the bottom line is the maturity model is useful no matter where you are, whether it be in government, private sector or global, it's a, it's a very strong document. I think it really does help. My recommendation is always to get your identity and access control um, in place. That's a great place to start if you don't have it already. And, and then look at your, you know, the, the value of your data to guide your journey. And you don't have to be uh, 
focused on pillars. Um, I'd also say that, you know, just another plug for the Cloud Security Alliance and CISA, we're always looking for participation, whether you want to roll up your sleeves and do some writing and thought leadership, or you just want to be involved to keep abreast of what's going on and, you know, kind of help progress the state of the art. I'll just go ahead and jump in real quick. And uh, probably my final thoughts are, you know, for the audience that, um, that, that is out there that's representing a, a wide uh, variety of backgrounds and organizations, if you're looking to, to start your zero trust journey and you're struggling to figure out where, um, you know, in addition to looking at our zero trust maturity model, give, a, give, a, uh, give some thought to looking at the OMB memorandum uh, 2209, it's publicly available. And look at what it has to say about the tasks um, associated with each pillar. Because I think if you start looking at it just for what it is, um, that's that's a place to start. It's it's a good one from my perspective. And it kind of takes the the and shapes the uh, the approach a little bit, if you will, um, to start down that path. I agree with all of that. And for those of you on the enterprise side, definitely, you know, even though these are federally produced documents, they're very highly relevant to the enterprise, uh, your enterprise environment. You know, use them as start as a starting point, and also use this as the opportunity to recognize that we can't just focus on security and technology, but we need to you know, maybe get out of our comfort zone and definitely build connections with our peers inside the business to drive and understand how what we're doing really satisfies a business problem and meets the business mission and delivers business value. That's how we get the support and the budget to actually drive these really necessary security improvements into our organizations. Yeah, I'll just uh, back clean up here. I think uh, it's really unique in a couple of ways, right? With first the government, the US government, five years ago, we really weren't looked at the government to lead some of these security discussions. And so I think that's the importance of cybersecurity to the federal government, how we are now, uh, not only leading, but trying to loudly help everyone else move forward in new ways. I think some of that's because of technology is really now in a place to help some of these principles that have been around for 10, 20 years. We talked about John Kindervog, there's been the Jericho Forum before him, but just moving security closer to the data, so cl closer to the application. We just couldn't do this 10 years ago. Uh, so it's just a unique time frame, both in terms of technology and where the government's trying to uh, uh, advocate for this new or this this new this new technology, but going back to this uh, the legacy or the first principle we've been trying to struggle to adopt for decades. But thank you for having us. Thank you, Sean, John, Jason, and Alex for presenting, and thank you to our participants for joining us today. If you have questions or would like to continue the discussion, please feel free to reach out to us at events at cloudsecurityalliance.org. We value your feedback and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for attending today's webinar and have a wonderful day.